called NIM, and we're going to be talking about privacy and blockchains and decentralized systems and distributed systems today, and a little bit about the internet and sort of more general systems outside of blockchains. And we're, we're a project that's basically about privacy. The kinds of things we're going to talk about today, um, why are we doing this? Like, what, what, are our, what are the things that we're interested in? What kind of problems are we interested in solving? Um, giving a quick definition of privacy. And we're going to talk about the two core technologies that we are um, working on. Uh, one of them is called the MixNet, which is a kind of better than Tor way of um, anonymizing your internet traffic. And the second one is decentralized credentials. So that's kind of like the quickest way I've ever tried to figure out to, to explain it to people is something like a decentralized OAuth. Um, but it's actually much more powerful than that. So you can actually use it to uh, anonymize pretty much any um, cryptocurrency transaction or blockchain transaction um, using anonymizing claims, which I'll explain in great detail in just a moment. Uh, then we'll do a quick demo and then we'll have a discussion. How many of you here are developers who have projects that maybe have interests in privacy? You think it would be useful to have different privacy preserving things? That's great. I'm super happy. Okay, good. So hopefully we can have a really good discussion as well. Uh, I think we should introduce ourselves first, just us as people. So, Anya. Yeah. Hi, hello everyone. My name is my name is Anya Petrovska. I'm the head of research at NIM, and I'm also a PhD student at University College London, where I research privacy enhancing technologies and, in particular, anonymous communication networks. Cool. And my name is David Rishin. As you can see from my last name, uh, I got quite an early start with encryption. Uh, I'm a, a founding member of a, a decentralized derivatives platform called the Vega Protocol. Um, I previously built a sharded um, scalable blockchain and consensus system called Chainspace, moved to Libra very briefly, and I thought that I was actually more interested in working on internet privacy issues, and so that's why I'm working here at NIM. Um, the wider team, this is the kind of production team, including some of our coders and uh, other surrounding people. And we actually have quite a large team of um, advisors from across Europe, from uh, four or five different universities across Europe, basically. So our goals, uh, we have one goal, so pending mass surveillance. Uh, why would we want to do this? Um, quick, quick kind of overview. I kind of think that the present situation on the internet is something like Crypto Wars 2, so it's like the sequel to the Crypto Wars. Um, for those of you who missed Crypto Wars 1, the original episode, the 1990s were quite, there were quite bold attempts by the US government to legislate uh, things like hardware backdoors into computers and network systems, uh, and they basically wanted to reroute all cryptography at the time. That was, that was their kind of big aim. Strong cryptography in the 90s was classed as a munition, and it was subject to export bans so that you couldn't share it outside the United States. Um, many arguments against privacy were advanced at that time, and if the anti-privacy advocates had won in the 90s, most of the internet systems that we use today would probably never have happened. But as it turns out, the original crypto wars were won during the course of the 90s. Um, I think that the, available, uh, the availability of SSL probably did more to advance security, security and privacy of the internet in the 90s than anything else. It's rarely viewed this way, but SSL and successor protocols like TLS are a practical and very important contribution <coughs> to help ensure civil rights worldwide. Uh, transport security is the core infrastructure of global civil society, in my view. Um, it also ensured that a lot of new industries could take root. So things like e-commerce, internet banking, private messaging, photo sharing, many of the conveniences of modern life that we take for granted Everything would be very different today if the coders, starting in the 90s, had been prevented from protecting user data. Now, today, just like in the 90s, we have a, a kind of new technical set of possibilities in front of us, and the same arguments uh, about privacy are being advanced. And I think that we have to, we have to win the kind of crypto wars too in order to make both uh, global civil society secure and also take advantage of the new economic opportunities that we have in front of us. Uh, yeah, so that's, in a nutshell, the reason why we're doing this. Uh, how? 
Okay. So, you might rightly ask how we're planning to do this. We have basically two core technologies in our system. The first one, as I said, is a MixNet, which is a better than Tor network security layer. Um, and Anya's a, a MixNet expert. She's going to talk about what better than Tor means. Uh, not to rag on Tor, because it actually does a really good job, but there are certain attacks against Tor, and we think we can just generally do a better job. The second thing, which I'll talk about, is a signature scheme that provides these properties, uh, and I'll go into those in detail in a little bit. But first, I'll hand off to Anya. Okay, thank you. So, um, I'll begin the kids the first time I'm using the clicker, so I might accidentally like explode the screen. I'll try not to. Uh, so before we're gonna jump to like discussing what mixed networks are, let's just discuss what privacy actually means. So privacy is the f fundamental human right. And we can think about privacy in the context of uh, legal basis, in the, in the context of human need, and we can also think about privacy in the context of computer security. So in context of computer security and in any other, the most general way to define privacy is that Privacy is the ability for us to decide what type of information we would like to share with other people or disclose about ourselves. And privacy is a, is a very complex topic because when we are building um, privacy enhancing systems, we have to make sure that we're gonna consider each of the components of the system in terms of privacy. So it's a very holistic property, which means that the information leakage in one of the components of the system may very significantly uh, degrade the privacy properties uh, provided by even the most enhanced cryptographic techniques in the other component of the system. So when we, because today we're talking about NIM and NIM is uh, a system for enhancing the privacy properties of the online users, the most basic um, component of the system which we want to run online is the network layer security. And when we're thinking about the network layer security, one basic thing which we're thinking about is the anonymity. So what is anonymity? Anonymity in general is the property which allows us to remain indistinguishable among other people performing similar actions or operations. And in the online world, we're going to talk about anonymous communication at the network layer. Uh, so we would like to hide the fact who is communicating with whom or who is exchanging information with whom. And why this anonymity is important? So if you're going to think about network layer security, uh, you have to think about the metadata. So when the internet was first introduced in DARPA, it was developed as a small side project focused on fast packet switching, and it was intended to be used for casual communication, not for um, exchange of confidential information. Therefore, there was a very small amount of thought put into securing actually this communication. And how it turned out, this little project ended up being a worldwide project, and we all use internet nowadays for everything. And every online activity which we perform leaves a digital fingerprint. What it means that every operation which you perform, um, with every operation which you perform online, is associated the metadata. What is this metadata? The best way to define metadata is to say that it is everything about your communication except the content. So this is information, for example, about who is communicating with whom, how often, at what times of the day, uh, what is the dynamic of the group, what is the sequence of communication, from which location you're communicating with people, and so on and so on. And when the PRISP program was revealed, uh, the NSA was saying that, hey, no a big deal that we are um, we're trying to record your communication because we are not reading your content, we are just looking at the metadata. But it turns out that this metadata carries a lot of sensitive information about the users, which very often is as revealing as the content itself. So you don't need actually try to decrypt the messages and look into the content to infer a lot of information about the users, which in result allows you to infer what are their relationship, what are their political or sexual preferences, religions, and so on and so on. So let's look at a couple of examples of privacy enhancing technologies which are very popular nowadays. I'm pretty sure you saw or heard at least about one of them. 
Uh, and let's think whether they offer us anonymity at the network level or not, and how good is this anonymity. So the first example is end-to-end -end encryption. I'm quite sure that you either use or heard about PGP for emails or end-to-end -end encrypted instant messaging applications like WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, and so on. So this is a very good example of a privacy enhancing technology which allows you to have confidentiality. So which allows you to hide the content of your communication, but it doesn't protect the network layer metadata associated with your communication. So even though you're hiding your actual messages, you're not hiding the fact with whom and how often you're communicating. Another example are the privacy enhancing uh, crypto coins. So I think I don't have to convince anyone that Bitcoin is not anonymous, but let's look at more privacy-friendly coins, like for example Zcash. So Zcash is a very nice privacy-supporting coin because it offers a good privacy properties on-chain, thanks to using the zero-knowledge um, technology, but it does not protect the network layer. So in result, the adversary who has access to the network layer is able to correlate users transacting just looking at their network addresses. And the last example is VPN, uh, so the virtual private network. So here we are getting a little bit closer towards securing the network layer of communication because actually VPNs offer um, some type of network level protection by offering an encrypted channel between the user and the VPN provider which acts as a proxy. But what is the limitation of the VPN? Well, VPNs are centralized, which means that um, simply you have to trust the VPN provider that uh, he will be behaving honestly because he is the one who sees your traffic between the user and the public internet. So in result, you have to trust that the VPN is not malicious or it does not keep any logs about your online activities and does not share it with anyone. So the research in uh, anonymous communication networks is definitely not new. Already in the early 80s, David Chow pioneered the idea of the first ever anonymous network called the mixed network. So I will try to give like a very brief crash course on what mixed networks are. So let's start uh, first, what is a mix? Mix is simply a router, a network router for any type of internet traffic which we would like to use. And a mixed network is just a set of such mix nodes. And don't be particularly phased that I'm showing the mixed network as a, just a single uh, sequence. Uh, in general, you can have many topologies of this network, uh, but just for simpli simplification, I have just a single path. But on top of being just a network router, the mixes have some security properties which allow you to remain anonymous at the network layer. Uh, so what are those properties? The first property is that a mix um, transforms the received packets cryptographically. Um, what does it mean? That if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, uh, she's going to encode her message into a special cryptographic packet format in such a way that each mix on the path between Alex, Alice and Bob uh, will remove one layer of this cryptographic protection. So if some of you know onion routing, it's a very similar idea. So we layer and encrypt the packets. And what this gives us is the property called bitwise unlinkability. This means that if the adversary observes any single mix and he sees packets coming in and packets coming out, he won't be able to correlate them looking at their binary representation. So the bit pattern of the packets in and out does not correspond to each other. Another property of the mixed networks and the mixes is not related anymore to the bit stream, but rather to the timing of the packets. Uh, so most of the routers on the network work at the first in, first out basis, which means the first packet coming in will be probably the first coming out. So imagine your mix works like that, and the adversary observes the mix, and he sees packets coming in and out, and even though he cannot correlate them uh, based on their binary representation, he would be able to correlate them looking at the time of their arrivals and departures. That's why the mixes do not forward packets at the first in, first out um, role. Instead of that, they reorder the packets following some secret permutation. Uh, what this does is that the timing correspondence between the incoming and outgoing packets is broken now. And there are many different ways to perform this 
reordering following secret permutation. The original charms um, mix networks operated in uh, synchronized batches, which meant that the mix is waiting the whole round, which can be, for example, an hour or something like that. Um, and gathers some packets, processes them, and at the end of the run, shuffles throwing a secret permutation and flashes to the next hop. So those two properties, the bitwise un unlinkability and the timing unlinkability, allow you to achieve anonymity of your communication because the mixes uh, are combined in long chains, and thanks to that, none of the mixes knows who is the sender and recipient because they only know the previous and the last and the, and the next hop, so they don't know what is the whole path and who is sending messages to whom. And at the other, uh, and at the same time, the adversary who's observing even the entire network and can sniff all the packets at all the links won't be able to correlate your communication. So as long as at least one mix in the path is honest, your strong anonymity re remains. So early mixed network designs had a couple of limitations uh, in terms of performance mostly, scalability and very high latency overhead because those batching runs required a lot of time to wait for many packets to arrive. That's why the NIM mix network is based on the modern mix network design called Lupix, which solves the problems of traditional mix networks. So a little bit uh, about how NIM mix network works and how we solve those issues uh, of limited performance in traditional mixed networks. So the first um, important thing is the network topology. So topology means that the mixed nodes are grouped into layers and the traffic is flowing from first layer to the last layer in one direction. And why did we pick the stratified topology? It's because as research has shown, the stratified topology has the, base, the best trade-off be between anonymity and performance and it's a topology which scales horizontally, which means that you can very easily scale your network uh, if the number of users using it increases or the volume of traffic increases, because you simply have to incrementally add more nodes. So for example, Tor is an example of a network, of an anonymous network which also scales horizontally. In terms of the bitwise unlinkability and the um, cryptographic packet format which we're using, we're using the Sphinx packet format. If some of you know Lightning networks, you will know that exactly the same cryptographic packet format is used in the Lightning networks. And the Sphinx packet format um, offers the unlinkability of the binary pattern and makes sure that all the messages are padded to the same length. But it also ensures resistance to tagging and replay attacks. And it allows to encode all the runtime information within the packet. What, uh, what means that the sender, as soon as he sends the message into the network, he can go offline. Which, for example, does not happen in Tor, because in Tor you have to be online all the time to be able to communicate when you're sending packets because you have an open circuit. In, in the, the NIM mix network, because we're using Sphinx, we can just send the message and go offline. And in terms of this mixing operation, this reordering, we use the so-called continuous time mixes. And this is a very uh, nice technique for mixing uh, the packets. Um, how it works, we don't have synchronized runs. Uh, we do not batch messages. Instead of that, each packet is delayed um, with some random amount of time. Uh, the sender, when uh, he's preparing the packet to be sent into the mix network, he encapsulates those random delays for each mix on the path. Um, this delay is randomized. And the mix, when he strips the level of cryptographic protection, he's going to see this delay and he knows for how long he should keep the packet before flashing it. And why actually this is a good technique for mixing? Well, we are picking the uh, delays from the exponential distribution. And the exponential distribution has a very nice property called memoryless property. What it means, um, imagine you are the adversary and you're observing a mix node. And you see one packet arriving at some, at some time and then another packet arriving to the mix at another time. And then you see a packet leaving the mix. This memory, a memoryless property tells you that you cannot um, guess which of the incoming packets is the one which you observe going out because the timing at which the packets departure from the mix is not correlated to their arrival times. 
And what it gives, like in the big picture, it increases the anonymity set. Because in the synchronized mixed networks, you have the anonymity set of the size of how many messages you've managed to gather during the run. Here, because everything works in a continuous manner, and the exponential distribution is long tailed, your, your anonymity set is much larger because you actually have to consider all the messages which you've ever seen arriving to the mix node as being potentially the one departuring. And the last thing about the NIMS mixnet is that, you know, it's very intuitive that when we're talking about anonymity, the larger the group of people among which you're anonymous, the better is your anonymity. So mixed networks very often use covert traffic. Uh, but the problem with the traditional mixed network design was that this covert traffic usually required a lot of bandwidth. And that's why in, them, uh, in the NIMS mix network, we're using a tunable cover traffic. A tunable means that when the volume of real traffic increases in the mix network, you can tune down the amount of cover traffic which you're using, and vice versa if the amount of real traffic is dropping. And the type of cover traffic which we're using is called a loop cover traffic. A loop means that the sender and the recipient of this packet is the same person. And both the clients and the mix nodes are sending loop cover traffic following the Poisson distribution. This uh, ensures that the packets, the real ones, and the loop packets are very nicely mixed together. So the adversary cannot distinguish, looking at some sample of traffic, whether he sees real messages or loop messages or half-half and so on. But the loop messages, they also have another very big advantage. They allow to detect and prevent active attacks. Uh, in which either malicious mixes or malicious adversary can block or drop some of the packets in the network. These are properties which were not in the traditional mixed network designs, so it's a very big advantage. Okay, just to wrap up about the NIMS mixnet, what is like the key takeaways you should remember is that we have a mixed network which has a very good uh, anonymity versus performance trade-off. The network scales very well. We can adjust uh, the latency which we need in our system depending on the amount and volume of traffic which we have. Uh, we uh, can uh, detect and resist active attacks. And yeah, so that's about mixed networks. All right, thanks, Anya. So that's half of our system. And uh, by the way, we're going to try to do, uh, uh, well, we're going to succeed in doing a demo because we don't have any dependencies on internet because I shot a little movie uh, last night from my hotel room. So we'll actually be able to see some of the stuff happening. So I'll, we built a small chat application just as a kind of tester. Um, and we, you'll be able to see um, messages going into the mixnet and going between two terminals as a kind of simple example. Um, but you could use Mixnet for many more things than chat. You could use it to pretty much anonymize any of your blockchain transactions, any of your cryptocurrency transactions, um, or anything else for that matter. Um, yeah, the second part of our system is a system of privacy-preserving credentials. So these are we're, we're working at different layers here. A Mixnet defends you at the network layer. Um, whereas the, the credentials that we have can defend you at the layer of your transactions or of your blockchain. Um, so the MixNet protects your IP traffic as it's traveling across the un unprotected wilds of the internet, and the privacy-preserving credentials allow you to encode cryptographic claims and, and use them. So we're using um, a, a signature scheme called Coconut. So what is Coconut? Well, Coconut is a signature scheme and as you may know, all signature schemes have at least these three algorithms. That you need to be able to generate your keys, you need to, be able to verify um, a signature that you receive, and you, somebody has to be able to sign, basically. So given, given the public key of uh, the, the person that you want to sign a message for, you should be able to sign that thing, and then if anybody who has the, the, the public key that, that was signed with, you should be able to verify, right? So everybody's pretty much familiar with these things? Cool, a lot of nodding heads, very good. Cool. So NIM signatures are, it is a signature scheme, but we have several additional properties. So the first property that we add to the, the sort of normal three, um, we have blind signatures or blind issuance. Do, do people know what that means? Some people, not everybody, okay, cool. So again, David Chaum, cryptographic genius, invented blind signatures, um, which have some additional properties and functions. Um, let's take a fictional eCash scheme just to kind of 
use an example to try to walk through what a blind signature is. So I'm going to create a cryptographic claim, so a piece of cryptographic material that basically says uh, what I want to end up with is a bearer, a bearer token saying I have one dollar. Okay, that's, that's our aim. Don't take it out of the blockchain world for just a second. So I'm going to create this claim saying Dave has one dollar and it'll be in clear text. Cool. So I blind it locally on my client and that turns it into gobbledygook. So it just, it's just a you know, piece of stringy stringiness. Uh, and I'm going to send it to the bank over the network uh, along with a dollar, if I could transmit a dollar through, uh, through the pipes. Um, the bank is going to then sign it and saying they attest, yeah, Dave definitely has a dollar, we're holding it, cool, now he's got this claim that he can run around with, and they give me a signature back. So they've signed basically a piece of blind cryptographic material, they give it back to me, and now, I've got, now I unblind the credential, and I can um, basically delink that from what I got back from the bank. So I now have a bearer token, which attests that I own a dollar, and yet the, the bank never actually, um, they can't really identify me, because the, the, you know, the, all the other material in that blinded credential, um, they never saw it, they just saw some gobbledygook. So this process of that, so create the clear text, blind the clear text locally, send it to the signer, the signer signs it, uh, return it to the creator, and the creator unblinds it to use it as a bearer token. This is the, the kind of general process of blind signatures. Now, some of you may have noted that there's a problem with blind issuance. Can anybody detect what it might be? Well, you could have made them sign that you have $3. Exactly. So the signer has just been presented with this gobbledygook, and they've signed it, and they've given it back to me. So it could have said Dave has $1 million in it, and they would be unable to tell without some further active verification. So if you're the, uh, you're the bank, you get some gobbledygook, um, the usual solution to this is to use a zero-knowledge proof attesting that the message contains one dollar but reveals nothing else, so the serial number of the credential, my identity, anything like that. So there's a bit of zero-knowledge action inside this. So Coconut, our signature scheme, has this zero-knowledge proof ability, so that's one of the things that it does. So it can do blind issuance. Cool. A second thing that we have is uh, the concept of re-randomizable signatures. Has anybody ever run across this before? No, it's a pretty weird one. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate it in a little bit, but um, this type of signature has an additional algorithm to these three, which is basically randomize. So you basically can take a signature, um, and then from that signature you can call the, call the randomize method on it, and you can basically um, generate a brand new credential, which is cryptographically equivalent to the original credential that you originally had in your hand, uh, is completely delinked, it com com completely anonymizes the cryptographic material that you have in the bearer token. Um, so it looks like a brand new credential is sort of unlinkable between the two, but it can still be verified through cryptography in this, as if it was the original one. So I'll demonstrate that in a bit. Um, but that basically can make your bearer tokens um, untraceable. So you get a bearer token back from some kind of authority, you call the re-randomize re -randomize method on it, you get a, a new bearer token that has the same cryptographic material, but the authority can't say, yeah, this was Dave that generated this because I saw that one and I gave it to him. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so what is this used for? So you could create multiple signatures and show them to different people, but the people that you show it to cannot link you back to the orig original signature or to any of the other re-randomized signatures. But the underlying messages in, 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 the, in this case is all the same, so the, con the cryptographic content is all the same across all these uh, credentials. So we basically have multiple anonymized bearer tokens that can each be validated as if they were the original. So we have the property of unlinkability. Um, cool. Uh, we also have a concept of selective disclosure. So in a traditional scheme, when you sign the message and somebody, when somebody verifies the message, they have to verify the whole thing. Okay. So selective disclosure means that instead of needing to verify the whole message, you can have people verify only certain attributes in the message, keeping other parts of it private. So let's consider uh, an example again to make things easier. Uh, let's assume that we have a passport. So my passport has my name, my nationality, age, photo, and place of issue in it, right? So these are the attributes in the passport. Um, let's say I want to go to the pub and have a drink. And the, I, I mean, I'm so old that I would never need to prove that I'm 
old enough to get in, but other people might need to actually like produce some kind of ID, and uh, you know, you could in an electronic kind of way, you, you might send your whole passport over, right, and identify yourself completely. But actually, can anybody see what, what we actually need to get into the pub here? Age. Age and photo. Right. And actually, we don't even really want to say, you know, how old is Dave, because he's really super ancient. What we really just want to say is he's over 18, right? So that's, that's, uh, that's basically what we want to selectively disclose. So Coconut allows us to do this. Um, so you basically sign a tuple of all the fields in the passport, and when it comes to verify, the verifier can verify only some of the attributes. Uh, despite the fact that the rest of them are still there, um, you can selectively choose to disclose these things, and you can selectively choose to disclose different ones to different people, basically. Um, so yeah, so basically we have three parties. Uh, we have the passport authority, the subject, that's whoever wants to go in the pub, and then we have the, the relying party, we call it, which is the bouncer at the pub door, right? And you can basically choose to selectively disclose some or all of the attributes in the message. Um, so, when you put it all together, selective disclosure can be applied to normal signature schemes without blinding, without re-randomization. So, you can get a signed message from an authority and disclose them selectively. Um, and this provides privacy against the relying party, the bouncer, and also against the passport authority, right? Um, oh, sorry. If you go to this, if you go to the pub again, or uh, if the if the passport authority wants to, without the other properties, uh, that is, blind issuance and re-randomizable signatures, they can identify you the second time you go to the pub as being the same person, right? Or the passport authority to break your anonymity if they wanted to. If we combine all of these things. Blind read credentials, re-randomizable signatures, and selective disclosure, we can protect the user's provide, um, privacy against multiple shows, that is, uses of the credential, at the pub. So the bouncer will always think it's the first time you've been there, which might be important in certain applications. Um, and we can also protect you against the passport authority, who has no way of linking the credentials you're using to what they issued. Now, Keep in mind, we're not really talking about making a passport authority. Any kind of authority that you want to have that can assert any useful information about anything in your applications can be contained inside um, a NIM credential. Um, so all the elements thus far basically um, existed in the cryptography literature, and we were, we're just stringing them together. So like this isn't some you know, mind-blowingly new set of things. Maybe you haven't heard of it before, but all of this stuff basically exists, um, but they only existed in centralized systems. So up until now, it's been impossible to string these things together in decentralized systems, and that's what um, Coconut, Coconut basically gives you, is this one more thing, um, which is threshold issuance. So you can actually have uh, a decentralized set of authorities all generate part of a credential. Um, so that allows the, 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 the kind of um, the decentralization and the kind of blockchainization of, of using these kinds of attributes for the first time. So we're not aware of anybody else who's done this. Um, so it makes all of these other things, like blind issuance, re-randomizable signature, selective disclosure, usable in a blockchain context. Uh, so this is known as a threshold signature scheme. So that's basically what Coconut does and what the MixNet does. I'll, maybe I'll break for some questions here, just to keep things going back and forth. And then I'll do um, a quick architecture diagram of what we have running right now, and then I'll show, uh, that can show some of this stuff in action. Yeah, cool, so questions, any? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned <coughs> and, and repeat attacks. It rings a bell. Here's the first major question. Yeah, we'll repeat it, yeah. 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 It, it rings a bell, but I... Oh, okay, so the question is, what is that tagging and replay attack? Uh, so a tagging attack is if the adversary is able to snoop, to sniff a packet going through the network and then flip like a single bit, for example, in order to be able to like trace this packet further in the network. So if you don't have a, a cryptographic packet format which will be resistant to that, it will just flip a bit and then it will be able to trace the packet. The replay attack uh, can be used also for tagging. It means that you're repeating the same packet once again, 
just for example to see where it will go again. So you are able to sniff it and then resend it again. Uh, you mentioned that you like set out to basically build something that's better than Tor in terms of network security. Yeah. Uh, so the main attack against Tor is essentially a government agency running like over thirty percent of all nodes, and by having a majority of exit nodes, they just see where the, all the packets end up. Um, how do you address that attack? So, for example, the thing in Tor is that all the packets are going like all all your packets, communication packets, are going by the same circuit. Uh, so with the same entry and exit node. Here in the mix network, every packet is going by an independent path, which is selected randomly. So this is already causing a, lot of, a little bit of trouble because then it's not that the agency can just, you know, <coughs> like try to control some of the exit nodes and so on. Uh, another thing is that uh, when, we'll be, when we run the mix nodes, uh, there are a couple of techniques which allow you to Mm, detect any nodes um, based on the reputation. So try to build the reputation which nodes are the honest ones and which might be malicious ones. Quick one. Is there any incentivization to run a node? Yes, so exactly. Um, I don't know, Dave, whether you want to talk yeah, about that. Sure. Yeah, so. Um, we basically, just to complete our, give a quick maybe visual overview, and it might help partly answer some of the question. We basically have two, two chunks of our, two, two parts of our system. Uh, at the top here is the MixNet, and then we also have um, validator nodes of decentralized authorities that communicate among themselves in a kind of BFT round, so they're doing that. And we have some dummy service providers over here built as well. Um, to talk about, uh, you know, to answer your question, we have a system which we haven't yet built. So all of the all of the stuff I've just drawn here actually is running right now, and uh, you people can start to integrate against it, try it out. The, this this new thing that I'm about to talk about doesn't yet exist as running code because it's only a few weeks old. So it's kind of we, we just haven't had a chance yet to, to actually put it together. But it's um, essentially a way of saying, okay, cool. The original Lupix design. I, I need to take a bit of a detour, but I'll, I'll get back to it. Um, was okay, cool. Your client starts sending um, stuff. So we, we have a packet, <coughs> which is like here. Think of it as like uh, some uh, encrypted Russian dolls that all kind of open up, right? So the center doll, the, the little, littlest one, is, is the, the message you're actually trying to send. Then there's these layers of encryption. And that basically defines a path that goes in here, comes out here, goes this way ends up at this uh, storage node over here, and then the offline client maybe that was here, maybe somebody comes out of the, the metro or something like that, grabs that and actually gets the content delivered, right? Now, the original design of Lupix, which is um, something that Anya worked on, was very individualistic. So you can do loop, loop traffic, it's called, and you can be um, spitting, even if you're not sending any real messages through the system, you might be spitting uh, loop traffic through, so your, your packet might go boom, 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 and actually loop back around to you and say, cool, wow, my message made it through. So you send maybe one every 10 times, you send a loop packet around, and you can, you can basically see, cool, these guys delivered my message, right? The problem we have to solve is, okay, for, if this is me, well, I'm, a, I'm a good person, I, I would never say anything wrong, how can we, if, if we just rely on the users to do this measurements, that I could also be an attacker, right? So we have to come up with a way of verifying the, the behavior of each of these nodes in a way that's publicly verifiable, you know, in a way that's kind of akin to like a, a BFT consensus system, right? Because I could say, hey, my, my packet never made it past here, and if we rely on my individual judgment, I could be the attacker trying to damage the reputation of this node, right? So we've basically come up with a way of using a verifiable randomness function to pre-generate a bunch of packets and assign them to clients. The clients will send them through. The VRF will be revealed at the end of a timed round. And we can then check, does the Merkle trees of each of these nodes, which they've been keeping for record keeping purposes basically, they have to show the Merkle trees and the commitments inside the Merkle trees that each node has. They send that back to the, uh, the staking authorities and the staking authorities can then verify um, did they do the right thing. 
at a kind of system level, not at an individual level. So this is something we've just come up with. Um, it's probably the first time that anybody's come up with a kind of incentivization system that works with a mix net like this. So we're quite proud of it. Um, we haven't built it yet, though. I would just, so just to wrap up this incentivized system is that we are checking the quality of service offered by the mixes, and if we see that some mixes are behaving dishonest on a, or in a malicious way, yeah. we are just cutting from their stakes. So, and if you are uh, acting honestly, you can get rewards for you. By you, you mean uh, start company? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, as as far as I understand it. Um, Tor just has a very simple, it just sends the messages out directly. There's a mixed network, want to use a puss on distribution yeah. for the for sending out the messages. Um, and also, the different classes of applications will have different profiles. How do you want to create those profiles for the different applications? What processes and tools will you use to create those? Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. So just make sure I understand your question. You're asking like if people, if we discuss different use cases where people send different volumes of traffic. For example, like a chat application yeah. and a Bitcoin wallet will have different. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit of the background, um, in the Lupix design and hence in the NIMS MixNet, uh, we enforce kind of the clients to send following a following a Poisson distribution. What does it mean? Imagine you have a phone and you press the button send. Your message is not immediately injected into the mix network. Instead of that, it's buffered in like a special queue, which is controlled by the Poisson process. And from time to time, at random times, this Poisson process wakes up and checks this buffer. If there is a real message, he <coughs> picks this message and sends it. If there is no real message, he sends a loop cover message. What this gives you is that your sending pattern is unobservable. So from the perspective of the adversary who's observing your client, it just looks like you're always sending something, but whether you're sending real traffic or just cover traffic, we don't know that. So coming back to Amir's question, uh, if we have different use cases like instant messaging or email, so one is fast sending, the other is slow sending, then we can adjust this Poisson process to be sending faster or slower, but we actually all the time obfuscate the sending pattern of the client, so the adversary cannot tell whether you're actually communicating with someone or you're just being completely you know, on hold. So, yeah, so we, we have a very, very um, preliminary, let's call it, demo. Um, I hope nobody tries to judge us on our graphic design or anything like that. I'm just going to show, we, I've just built built the client, cool. We have a really cool, like a uh, set of graphical you know, introduction to the client to it as well when we started. Um, basically, I'm about to run it here, uh, just, so, just so you can see what it says. I, I've, I've edited an Alice user, so it's like Lupix client init Alice. Um, so Alice now gets some private, private and public keys generated and stored on her system. Um, cool. Now it started to run. In the kind of Lupix client binary, which you'll be able, you can you can integrate against if you're actually interested in like trying to make your applications work with a mixnet. We have a bunch of running mixnet nodes. We have this topology of six nodes running on the internet right now with two um, storage nodes at the end. So even if your your kind of end user clients are offline, you can do that. As soon as we told Alice, as soon as Alice said, "Hey, I'm going to run this client." the client automatically starts sending packets. So it starts encrypting packets through the system and sending them back to herself, right? So it starts generating cover traffic as soon as the client has started up. This client doesn't do anything else than that. So you might be a bit disappointed if you just like fire it up and then you'd be like, oh wow, that doesn't really do anything. But it is actually doing something. If you like, if you, if you Wireshark yourself, you'll be able to see the cover traffic going. However, uh, we're basically, within the next week, our plan is to build a set of um, socket interfaces so you can just have this binary sitting inside your application, you can connect it to it by either a web socket or a TCP socket and just push bytes into it. And those will be those bytes that you push into it will basically go through the mixnet and you'll be able to send messages. So as a kind of example of that, we're building uh, a chat client and we've got it built, I'll just show it right here. So I'm just gonna, I'm just backing out I'm saying, okay, cool, we're gonna go to the chat client demo. 
and I'm going to spark it up. So we're going to use this Alice thing, this Alice user. Cool. So now again, it says what Alice's public key is, and she has to figure out who she wants to communicate with. We've also made a Bob user, and I'm just going to start him in another terminal there. Start up Bob. Good. Cool. He selects Alice's public key, which has to be sent out of band, so he has to know that. Um, cool. Now we have this two message thing. Now just as that kind of goes through, I'll just explain what's going on. We have two clients. Both of them start sending cover traffic, and we have a dashboard that you can actually see on the internet right now. It's at dashboard.nimtech.net. Um, and you can, we're, we're always sending cover traffic through that anyway. And you can basically see um, the, the cover traffic going through the nodes, because it, it tells you, you know, this node here, let's say, in the last one second, it sent 20 packets and it received 18 packets or 12 packets, whatever, whatever it happens to be. So you can basically get a view overall of the whole network and what's happening within it. Um, yeah, so you can see the speeds. This is actually going through from my hotel room in Japan to our mixnet in um, uh, Europe somewhere. Uh, uh, through the six nodes and then back out back to Japan. So it's you can see the speed's actually not that bad as far as when something um, is typed in here or you can see it appear on the other side quite rapidly. So it's yeah, it's definitely sub-second latency. It's like sort of 300, 400 milliseconds, I'd say, um, of latency that gets added uh, at that thing. So we can also see the mix nodes and the validators here as well. And if I just back it up a little bit, I think you'll be able to see right here. Yeah, cool. Over on the right hand side there, you can see it says received and sent. In that one second period, that's what the, the mixed nodes are actually receiving in. And you can see, you can kind of tell that the order, re reordering is happening inside the nodes because otherwise the numbers would be exactly the same of sent and received uh, in that one second period, and they're not across. Um, all of those things. So, that, so that's the reordering of the packet, the packets. Yeah? Uh, if I have a server, can I contribute like resource right now already? Or? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's uh, the, 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 the repos that we have are completely <coughs> open. The chat client might not be, but that's more an oversight. The, 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 the main nodes, though, both the, the NIM validator nodes that run the credential system and the uh, mix nodes that run the, the mix, mixing system, it's all open right now. So you can, you can look at it and have a look. Uh, it's not super beautiful. Yeah, go ahead. So I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, the first one is uh, how the directory service is provided. Like, how yeah. do I know what nodes cool. there are? So right now we're running a directory server at directory.nintech.net. Um, it's centralized at the moment, but that's a temporary thing because we need to bootstrap the network, and then I need to figure out what my next move is going to be as far as just you know distributing the presence information around. Um, we we have several good options for doing that. I just haven't picked one yet. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I have a yeah. uh, so, what is the significance of deciding in advance the delays? Why cannot rope, why cannot the individual nodes just you know come up with random delays? I'll, I'll pass off to Ms. Mixnet. So, so there are a, a couple of reasons why. The first one is if you're the sender and you're picking the delays in advance for each hot you know where your packet should arrive at the other end. This allows you to, for example, <laughs> expect an, an acknowledgement for your packet. So you will know whether your message got to the other end or not, whether one of the mixes dropped it or not. Uh, so that's one of the advantages. Um, yeah, and it's the main one because also it will allow you to detect malicious mix now. Uh, if your packet, you didn't get the acknowledgement for your packet, this means that maybe your packet was dropped somewhere on the way, and you should investigate which of those mix nodes potentially dropped your packet, and so on. Cool. Uh, I, I just see that here, received and sent, uh, I expect that to be equal, kind of. So you're not received and, you, and you're not sent. And uh, they're quite different. <laughs> they're, they're supposed to be different, because the, the, the packets as they're received are held for random amounts of time. That's why so that's why we get the reordering. So if they were the same, that's when we would be um, unhappy yeah. because then we would be going like, why? Why? It's just 
Maybe, what if it's just passing the same things in and out in the same order and it's not reordering anything? What it's actually doing is, it's, we can tell it's working because it's holding the packets for uh, a random interval and there, therefore we can see that it's actually mixing. But uh, why don't some nodes send more messages than theirs? Because it's like, this is measured I think per second. Yeah. So they also like, imagine like in one second you receive 10 packets, yeah. in the other second you send five of them, okay. and then you receive another five and then you send 15. Okay. So like there is all the time okay. this shuffling yeah. of the packets. The so it's not overall. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, what is the addressing scheme for the nodes? Uh, do I address them by public key? Or, and uh, how do I connect an external process uh, to it? Is there like a or? Yeah, so the client, the client binary is the thing that you'll, you'll want to use. Um, it's written in Go right now. Um, so if you're a Go user, you can just compile the client right into your, in, into your software. If you're not a Go user, we're, we're going to provide um, socket connections. So let's say you were, I don't know, a JavaScript or just for instance, There'll be a WebSocket connection. You basically your, your application has to fire the binary up. That will take care of all the key generation, all of the um, loop cover traffic, all of the kind of mixed netty stuff for you. And then you you're, you subscribe to events on that WebSocket, and you can push events into the WebSocket. So from your point of view, you're making a chat application with a WebSocket, or you're making some other application socket in JavaScript, and it goes. Uh, into the, the Go binary, the Go binary goes, hey, cool, does this guy have any like real stuff to send? No, cool, send a cover message, good. Or if you have real stuff to send, um, yes, then good, we'll send, we'll send your real stuff. And it, it will take care of all of that stuff for you. And the, the, the client um, also takes care of going to the directory server, looking up where all the nodes are, downloading, like grabbing their public keys, getting the whole network topology, everything like that. And then the, the client will automatically uh, do your um, client-side routing for you, so you never, as an application developer, need to think about, you know, what, what path am I going to choose or anything like that. It's all done for you. Uh, so if I have a, a service inside me that's, for example, a service like a send me a file, um, could I uh, retrofit curl to, to fetch the file by going through a Sox proxy locally? You would need to packetize it. That would be the one thing that you would need to do in, the, in that case. So if you, you need to chop up that file into yeah. chunks that match the size of the, of the mixed net packets. Okay. Um, and at the other end of, of your application, you would need to provide some way of turning those packets into something that maybe gets reordered if you need ordering in your application. So that's the... It's actually uh, like an IP layer without TCP. Kind, yeah, kind of. It's, uh, it's like a super anonymous UDP, I guess, uh, you know, we've just reinvented. Um, there's one more thing that we've got here, which is a, a quick demo of the credentials. I'm just going to jump forward a tiny bit, uh, just to see you can see it running. Cool. We're just uh, that's, this is loading up some configuration files. But basically, what we have here is a wonderfully designed Qt thing, which basically will take um, some ERC20 NIM tokens in, just as a kind of demonstration. It's not for any uh, real reason. What I'm trying to do is demonstrate the kind of flow. So basically, what's going to happen is the client that's this uh, white thing you see on the screen, will uh, ask for, hey, here's Ethereum. We're gonna ask for Ethereum to basically pump some Ethereum tokens into NIM, uh, into this Tendermint round, which is what we're actually using for the, um, for the validators. Uh, that will create some NIMs on, in, the, in the Tendermint side of, of things. You'll then get back a credential from the validators. So all these guys will respond to you and say, cool, yeah, uh, here's, your, here's, here's each piece of your credential, because you get a, you know, a threshold credential. We can then re-randomize the credential, and I'll, we'll show that working. And then you can spend the credential with a service provider, and the service provider can then redeem it over here and say, cool, pay me, and we can have double spending protection there as well. So that's, that's the basic flow of the coconut credentials. So, cool, we just got, uh, 10 NIMs in. We're going to create a credential that encodes five NIMs in this case. Don't get sucked in by thinking you always have to put currency inside your credentials. This is a very general purpose system. So uh, the NIM credential is the same thing as like, um, like this application is like a smart contract. Uh, as it's, it's what a smart contract is to the EVM. The, 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 the basic thing underneath all of this is very general purpose. Cool. We've got back a, a partial credential. Our client has reassembled it over here. And I'm pressing the re-randomize button. 
And you can see the credential changing right there as I'm pressing it. So I just re-randomize it five times. It has now the same five NIMs inside the credential that it always had, but it, it is a totally different credential than what we got back from these issuing authorities. So they can't rat on me anymore. They can't tell who, who, who they gave it to. Even if they colluded, they would be unable to do that. So we then sent the credential from our client to some kind of service provider to pay for something. Could be for anything. Um, that's great, the service provider redeemed it. That means it's been spent. I then tried to, to spend it again, and it said, no, you've already spent it. The really interesting thing, I'm gonna re-randomize it another five times here, so you can see the credential changing again. So Sorry if it's a bit faint. I try to spend it now, and despite the fact that it's a brand new credential, the blockchain has rejected it as being already spent. So the cryptographic material in there has been recognized even if it's a different credential. So we still have double spending protection even with the re-randomization. Cool, that's pretty much it. So any other questions? How is your work funded? Uh, we have some investment from different uh, different VCs. Yeah. So we've been talking to the service provider go through the basenet or could you still identify it, by it? Sure. It doesn't right now, but eventually the vision is that it will. I just haven't had time to plumb it all together quite yet, but yeah. Uh, what VR construction are you? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. What, which VRF construction, I think I heard? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't remember. Yeah, I can't. Uh, the, uh, the, the person who invented it, the, the two people who invented the scheme aren't really here right now, so I'm not sure what they're planning to use there, so I can't say. Sorry. And also, like, the, we are working on the research papers related to that, so probably when the research paper will be out. So I just wanted to say that following your question, we are working on the research paper about this. So in the research paper, we'll probably discuss which VRF to use and which one is the best. So the VRF would also be used to randomize the <coughs> packet sent inside a mainnet? The, the client will still generate the path, but um, the mixed nodes will need to say what they saw. And yes, after, so afterwards, the VRF comes into play. Everybody opens up the box and goes, hey, did... did uh, did Timmy mix net node two like actually send the correct packets? And there's there's going to be a record of what he was supposed to have sent, basically. Yeah, and this VRF is used only for those special measurement messages which are checking the quality of service. The regular messages, it's up to the client what he is using to like pick the path, run the path, the delays, and so on. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. We're out of time. Um, but if if uh, people want to keep on chatting out in the hall, um, please come say hello. And if anybody's interested in um, trying out some of the code or trying to develop against this, then, yeah, then please come talk to me as well. Thank you. Thank you.